and this is what's going to happen. And I knew it. It was just that, that everyone else knew it. And that's what people want today. They want that. You want that. The idea that we can go back to that. And it's not that way anymore. I'm not saying it's also, you know, run away and hide. That was a decision made. These are policies. This is a choice we made as a country. You don't have that anymore. Your generation is going to be worse off than your parents' generation. And that was a decision that was made. This is policy. This is choices. And that is history. These are much choices. It isn't all of a sudden it happened, you wake up today and that happens. <coughs> These were political choices. And that doesn't mean it can't be reversed if you, you know, if people in the United States want to reverse it. But that is the reality. You know, we, the whole thing about caring for the children I always find fascinating. Because you would think about, okay, we want to care about the generation. What about future generations? Well, does a society care about the future generations? If they decide to have college expenditures go up by about a thousand percent over 20 years, is that caring for the future? I don't know. Well, those are the kind of questions that you have to ask. And that fits in with this. These are policy decisions that were made. We've gone from Keynesian back to trickle down. Now, trickle down might work, it might lead to the boom. And maybe it won't, but let's get to the, the election of 1936 coincided with the rise of labor unions. So we're going to watch just a little bit of a clip from the last little bit we're going to see from the New Deal of the Great Depression one. And this is called Mean Things Happening. But it's about, I'm going to start it right when they did. Violence and protect labor, Congress passed the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act. Although it did not cover farm workers, it promoted collective bargaining in the industrial workplace and gave the National Labor Relations Board the power to stop unfair labor practices by employers. The National Labor when Relations Wagner Board really became a key passed, factor. This was a kind of renaissance for those of us who had undergone all of this uh, medieval treatment in our workplaces and uh, we uh, idolized President Franklin Delano Roosevelt we thought he was one of the greatest men ever born and uh, he renewed our lives our inspiration uh, especially in our unions by the way can you think of a better politician at least up to that moment when you have people saying they idolized President Roosevelt my guess is he'll vote for Roosevelt forever. Many corporate leaders were outraged by the Wagner Act and President Roosevelt. In Aliquippa, J&L defied the new law. This is the legal struggle would go all the way to the Supreme Court. Tom Girdler, now head of Republic Steel, saw the Wagner Act as a threat to his relationship with his employees. Girdler had built Republic Steel into a profitable powerhouse. He wanted no government interference. Father thought Franklin Roosevelt was a disaster. It was during the Roosevelt years that the adversarial relationship between the unions and the companies was promoted to the greatest extent by the union and backed by the government. You may say that I John L. Lewis, president of the United Mine Workers, saw the Wagner Act as an opportunity to organize all industrial workers, including the millions of factory workers and blacks and immigrants excluded by the American Federation of Labor. Lewis broke with the AFL and formed the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The Congress of Industrial Organizations would be the first major industrial union all workers and its legacy goes back to the knights of labor in the iww that includes that includes people who were not white and it includes women this is a big deal they tried to join up with the afl yes um what person the president united mine workers but he would start the cio yes sir. 
It was the, the, what's it called, the Congress? Congress of Industrial Organization, the CIO. They were supposed to form with the AFL. And this is a little bit of a massive conference. It's hard to tell how big it was, but there were over 10,000 workers. The CIO. At this conference here. The AFL would not take them. The workers of this country want representation. They want organization. They want participation. But this is what people want. They want protection. They want employment. And they're going to have those things through the leadership and the instrumentality of this new labor movement that you're causing. <laughs> so, this is when they, the CIO workers had walked out of the AFL conference. Before it walked out, the AFL voted whether or not we'll allow unskilled workers, and unskilled basically meant just most workers. The AFL was made up of these little, tiny, skilled working units, unions. And representative one after the other, these different smaller unions said, no, we don't want this basically riffraff. And they attacked John L. Lewis at this. So this is Lewis talking, and these are the members of CIO, just a couple days after this big conference was in Philadelphia. The head of the Boilermakers Union was out there basically just bashing Lewis. And these are, you know, pretty tough crew up there. He, Lewis is this, and basically how Gary breathes this, this rap this rabble in here. And how dare we bring blacks into this union? So it's a little racist to me. It's really unbelievable. Lewis walked on stage while this guy was talking. Walked on, no preamble, nothing. Just walked up and bang, knocked him cold right there. And the whole place erupted in a fire. And we're not talking just a little fire. I mean, this is beating people with chairs, fire. Oh, yeah, we're talking awesome. But so much fun. But. That's how the CIO broke apart. And the CIO would become more successful than the AFL. 20 years later, the AFL would beg the CIO to merge with them. Yes. What was the AFL? The American Federation of Labor. Remember, that was the one we went, we talked about the Knights of Labor <laughs> way back when? Those heady days in December? <laughs> And once you have this organization of the white man, the whole thing is not the white man. You have to steal the power and the power. You have an election that you're telling. John L. Lewis's main target was the steel industry, the citadel of anti unionism. Steel underlay the whole industrial American operation. At the time when we were a country of smokestack industry, we needed steel to make the automobiles. We needed steel for all the purposes of industry. If there was no steel, there was no industry. This was the heart of the matter. In June 1936, Lewis formed the Steel Workers Organizing Committee. Don't SWAT. write this up. I'm just saying the CIO pledged a half million dollars to begin the battle with the steel companies. Lewis chose Phil Murray, vice president of the mine workers, to head SWAT. Murray broke with tradition by including blacks and communists on his organizing team. So this was a big difference. And by the way, this will hurt unions down the road. A bunch of communists. Remember the bomb throwing anarchist thing? And one more thing. Yeah, a lot of eyebrows here. I got bad news for all of you. When you get older, eyebrows and things like that just seem to go faster. Just warning you, it's not fair. That's why I shaved them off. This is, this is latex. Okay. There was a ferment that's hard to imagine. People ran out of cards. These are cards. You know, you went out to organize. You didn't have to plead with people and convince them. They grabbed the cards. They were ready. They'd been long ready. This was a depression. They wanted something done. I didn't, you know, never attended a union meeting before. And there was an outside guard. And this guard uh, asked me where I was going. I said, is this a meeting of 1014? He said, yeah. I said, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a member. I'd like to go. He said, you know the password? I said, what password? Never heard of a password. So uh, he looked at me, and I guess he recognized I was sincere. He said, well, look. I'm going to give you the password. You're not to repeat it to anybody, whether they're members of the union or not. You're not to write it on anything. You have to memorize it. I said, okay. And he whispered to me, expansion. 
I know it to this day, I know it. So In the 1936 presidential election, big business spent heavily to defeat Roosevelt and end the advance of unions. So that's why I want to do the union and the election together. Because it really became an election, not just about the New Deal, but about the Wagner Act. Roosevelt is going to be outspent five to one by his Republican opponent in that election. The Democrats, of course, the FDR, and they're riding high. But Republicans, they nominate the relatively moderate Alf Landon of Kansas. Yes, we did not. We came, it, never, it actually wasn't close. We didn't have a president named Alf. Five to one spending, and that was to stop unions. But here's Roosevelt going around the country and making it very clear to workers, this is not about image. This is not about um, you know, some little minor issue. The New Deal is making your life better. The Democratic Party is making your life better. Vote for the Democratic Party. And that is how one of the few times in the, tw in the last 100 years you have an election where it's not going to be based upon image and money, but it really will be based upon, we are making your life better, vote for us. Now, some people would disagree, but Roosevelt would say, we're making it better, you want to go back to the Depression. Was it better? It depends on who you are, obviously. And Roosevelt's no the labor fought back. Unlike the sharecroppers in the South, union members in the North had the vote. The CIO held hundreds of rallies for the president and registered thousands of new voters. Seeking their support, Roosevelt made labor's enemies his own. The best concentration of economic power in all embracing corporations does not represent private enterprise as we Americans cherish it and propose to foster it. On the contrary, it represents private enterprise which has become a kind of private government and is a power unto itself, a regimentation of other people's money and other people's lives. The uh, Roosevelt administration did everything they could to further the interests of the working people. By the working people, I mean the union people. He because there were more votes there than there were any other play bills, and I think it was primarily for that reason. Two months after Roosevelt's landslide victory. Yeah, this was the biggest victory in American history. There has never been anything like that in a contested race. There have been a couple of presidential elections that might have had greater popular vote or great electoral college victory, but really, only a couple. And they were great, all about the same. But the big thing is, this was such a big victory because the Democrats swept every race. There were, the Republican Party was destroyed in, in virtually every house, state house, every state governorship, every, the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, and the presidency. And in fact, okay, presidency is a little bit different, but all states and the House and the Senate, they would be Democratic pretty much overwhelmingly to the 1980s virtually every state in the country through the years of the Great Compression. This was an unprecedented victory. Yeah, we're going to get some Republican presidents and a few little glitches of Republicans in control of Congress, actually only one time, up until 1980. Jeez, we won't have Republican control of Congress until 1994. But only once, and that's 46 through 48, will be Republican control of Congress. So this, I mean, this is like, wow, this is like an earth-shattering victory. A little bit like what happened in 1920 for the Republicans. John L. Lewis began secret negotiations with Myron Taylor, chairman of America's biggest steel corporation, U.S. Steel. Why I put that in there is once the election happened, the companies realized we better negotiate with the unions. And once that happened, U.S. Steel would do a collective bargaining agreement. And who did the sit-in strikes and they won too? Who was doing the sit-in strikes in the city? Remember what company? What 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 uh, market? What corporations? What businesses? Was it textile? Good. 
Good gas. They, they did some in textiles, but the really big one was in Flint, Michigan, or outside of Detroit. Yeah, GM. Car companies. The car companies. And once they saw the car companies and that the biggest company, and once that happened, it was like, okay, companies realized we have to make deals with workers now. And wages began to go. Taylor had watched CIO sit down strikers win union recognition after stopping production at General Motors. Oh, I should add this. He's wearing the little mustache. That still was not unpopular yet. <laughs> Did not want to risk a production shutdown by U.S. Steel. So, I'm going to stop it right there, but I want to show that, give you an idea how that's how politics work. You have, that's what the people want, politicians adjust to what the people want. You can work back and forth. Sometimes it works that way. I'm, most of the time it seems to be imperfect. But it's a really interesting time because with that, think about Roosevelt, though. I can do no wrong. I am Franklin Roosevelt. People voted for me, 60%. No one has ever voted that me. He won all but about 25 electoral votes. I can do anything I want. 32 won a big victory, but that was more of an anti-Hoover vote. This is a pro-New Deal. What happens every time when somebody feels they have unlimited power? What do they do? Huh? They do more stuff, and a lot of times do stupid stuff. Have you heard the term hubris? Hubris means kind of like you, you feel you have unlimited power and you start doing anything you want, so you're starting. Well, making decisions that looking back on it can be very bad decisions. Roosevelt will do that. At the height of his power, Roosevelt will make terrible decisions. I'm going to do this really fast. So, what Roosevelt did in 1937, it's going to be called court packing. Now, I don't know the way around. Unions grew very big. You know, this is going to change that, but great compression. But court packing, the Supreme Court has found two laws unconstitutional, two big New Deal laws, the NRA and the AW. So Roosevelt wanted to get rid of the conservative majority on the Supreme Court. How do you do that? Congress decides how many members are in the Supreme Court. So he wanted Congress to pass a law to go from nine to 15 members of the Supreme Court. That would allow him to appoint up to six members. It, there's a complex way of doing it, but we're just gonna keep it simple here. He can appoint liberals. Liberals mean pro-New Deal. His advisors told him, don't do this. First off, a lot of those guys in the Supreme Court, they're near the end. And there's something else. That's what dictators do. It's going to look like that you're going to create a rubber stamp judiciary to approve anything you want. Everyone got that? He's going to look like a dictator. He's going to look like a dictator. They told him that. You seem all powerful now, but your enemies are looking for a weakness. But he, Cubans, I can do anything I want. And he pushed it, and it went down in flames. A disaster. And here's the big deal why court packing was so important. It showed weakness. And now conservative Democrats who were scared to go against Roosevelt now had guts. The next big thing, actually he did one other thing, but we're going to get right to the next big one. In 38, I call it in your little, on your bookmark, the recession of 38, I have no idea why I do that. It's called the Roosevelt Recession. Oh, almost forgot. Maybe I told you, maybe I didn't. Here, remember now. I forgot to put the Great Depression on your list of terms. It's kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Compression. Did, did I tell you that already? No. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal. Like there's going to be a short answer question about that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a big deal. I'm sorry I forgot. I'm glad. Are you happy now? Okay. Thank you. Yes, your test. You get test B. You want to go from there was 19, but you wanted to get. No, if there was nine, you wanted to go to 15. Yeah. So we get appoint six more members, therefore, 
or therefore he could get his bill. <laughs> the Roosevelt's recession was this. He thought now it's time to balance the budget. And he vote he pushed Congress, ironically, his enemies are the one who supported him on this one, to cut spending, especially the wildly successful WPA. And as soon as he cut the WPA, I think you can probably guess what happened. The economy was not yet strong enough. You pull that money out of the economy, and what happened? Production dropped, recession, unemployment went back up to over 16% overnight. This crushed Roosevelt. He never again was that politically strong. Yeah, I mean, obviously he's going to be incredibly strong. He'll get a couple more laws passed, but none of his big initiatives would come. He could not get what he wanted because of these failures. He would change policy, but he wouldn't happen. Only two more major New Deal laws would be passed. Only two. He did not get the big things he wanted. This It was going to be a third New Deal. In 38, he got the Fair Labor Standards Act. I think you remember that from your quiz. That's the minimum wage. Minimum wage, if the minimum wage is high enough, it artificially kind of sets the, does the wage market to bump up all wages? If the minimum wage is high enough, it started at 15 cents an hour, different era, which is, is higher than today. The highest the minimum wage would be was in 1968, and the equivalent today would be about 16 bucks an hour. Today, the minimum wage is really low. It's seven and a quarter nationally. Eight is it? Eight? It's eight twenty-five. Yeah, yeah, it's eight twenty-five. Is it eight oh five? Yeah, eight oh five. Here, seven twenty-five, eight oh five. Because this, the national is kind of like a, a a floor, but states can go a little bit above that. Actually, some areas states can go below. Try to wait tables in New York. You know what I'm talking about? Their minimum wage is two bucks an hour. Tough gig. 40 hour work week. It started at 44 or 45, and then the idea was it would scale down to 40. That raises wages. Both these, the idea was to raise wages, need more workers. How do they enforce a 40 hour work week? <coughs> Wage earners get what if they work over 40 hours in a week? <coughs> yeah, time and a half, over time. So the idea being they have to pay more, it'd be cheaper just to hire somebody else, and limits on child labor. Ironically, after court packing, the Supreme Court would rule this constitutional, Social Security is constitutional, the Wagner Act. So in a way, it kind of worked, but it blew up his other ideas. The other one I'm just going to mention really quickly is the second awe. Uh, and the second awe uh, was an effort to raise crop prices. Raise crop prices. Basically, what it did is it set up a system to allow farmers to store surpluses. That's why if you go to a small town, let's say in the High Line, you go to Freud, Montana, who doesn't vacation in Freud? The only thing you really, from a distance, when you go, when you see you, when you're up in the High Line, you feel like you're going off the end of the earth, but also you see like a little hump in the horizon. That is the grain, the granary that was all built during the second AAA. And up until 1973, the policy of the U.S. was to keep crop prices high so small farmers could survive. In 73, they totally reversed that policy in an effort to keep farm prices low. And the stated goal of the Nixon administration was to destroy small farmers. And it worked. Small farmers are basically gone now. We'll get to Nixon. The only president I might have colorful statements for. All right, but he wanted civil rights reform. Roosevelt couldn't get it. He went to Jim Crow, couldn't get it. He wanted massive aid for education, including tuition-free college. Thankfully, that didn't happen. And that's me being facetious. <laughs> you would you would miss out all the fun of trying to come and paying for it. Can you imagine how much different your life would be? I mean, seriously, you want to talk about stability? It would change everything you think about what your future would be. But then again, with that kind of stability, that actually raises wages. We don't want that. 
and he wanted health care insurance. Couldn't push for it. We would have a national health care insurance except for the fact that Jim Crow laws. So we've never dealt with those things to this day in this country. Well, Roosevelt, because of the Roosevelt Depression, yeah. What else? Did he want other than health care insurance? Health care insurance, civil rights, and massive aid for education, including basically tuition free college. The big thing is they can funnel more people to higher education, that would increase opportunities, but also he really wanted, Roosevelt was, it almost seems old fashioned, almost seems quaint today. But he wanted education to also make people into good citizens, good members of this republic. So Roosevelt, after the after the Roosevelt recession, he's going to become a full-fledged Keynesian. Keynesian is liberal economics. Liberal economics. It's also called Demand Side. It's based on the writings of John Maynard Keynes. I know it looks like Keynes, but it's Keynes. An English economist, Keynes actually wrote Roosevelt 37. He said, don't cut spending. No, now is not the time. Don't worry about the budget deficit. Spend. Roosevelt ignored him in 37. At the end of 38, they tripled WPA spending. And literally, that is the moment when they tripled WPA spending because of this, the end of the depression was coming. You could see it. Unemployment just toppled. And then once the war started, then government spending ended it completely. Keynes was warning people and telling, and telling about this, about the chance of the depression before the crash, and he told countries spend. Spend now, get demand up. Only two countries listened to him by 32, or 33, I'm sorry. Most countries only did like partial efforts, like the US and Britain did partial. Only two countries spent madly, the heck with the deficit, worry about the deficit when times are good, and got out of the depression immediately. Sweden, of course, right? I mean, obviously. And who? No, Switzerland actually suffered for this a long time. One country, but Keynes didn't like to brag about this country Nazi Germany. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, they start. If you weren't clear, I, uh, it's a different ink for keys. That's what I like. It's spare. I gotta, no, we gotta make sure you know they're spare. All right. So I'm gonna draw this for you a table. Remember, trickle down was top down, and that's a form of redistribution of wealth from working people up. Here, it's from the entire economy, but also from the top down. So, we're going to start here and go up. Here we have workers. We're talking there about the bottom, I mean, literally. We're talking here about 95% of the population. Government policy will be to get wages up. When I mean that, we're talking wages. This is get wages up. You know, a major element of trickle down was get wages down and also encourage speculation. Here, the exact opposite get wages up. These are wages. So that's government. Before we get to that, what would that do? That's demand. So also, when people want money, they'll start spending money. Remember the big problem of debt deflation? Which probably should be a great short answer question. Meaning, wouldn't causes of the Great Depression be a great? Yeah. I'm just telling you what questions are going to be. But get demand up. Demand up, companies will begin to supply more goods, meaning increase production. When they increase production, they have to increase employment. When they increase employment, that puts more money in the workers' hands. So remember, trickle down was you create supply, that will create demand, and that will put more money in the hands of the wealthy. The capitalist. Here, the engine is we get demand up, that gets more employment and more money there. And the government programs are some were New Deal laws, some were New Deal laws that probably weren't big enough, but the whole idea is get demand up. And the thing is, you can cut these programs when times are good. 
So that's one of the ways they kind of control spending. <laughs> but one very important thing we have to get is here, deficit spending. Borrow money. This will make up for the lack of demand. Borrow it. In good times, you can pay it off. But in bad times, because of debt deflation, nobody spends. But the government can borrow, and they can print their own money. And governments have an army. That allows them to collect taxes. So, it's like red underneath it. I got red on this pen. And I broke the pen. <laughs> Third period, I threw it at Mr. Zanto. <laughs> Each one. All right, so. <laughs> so other ways you do it. Pro-union, progressive taxation, uh, regulation. And the regulation is not only laws like Glass-Steagall, that avoid financial speculation, you know, to keep money, keep finance becoming too big, so it funnels money away from this engine here, but also antitrust laws. For 40 years, one of the great legacies of the New Deal, great as it's big, I don't mean like great as in a value judgment, but was to try to break up monopolies. Monopolies, lower wages. Monopolies, lower wages. The more companies are in a market, the more competition it is for workers, the more competition leads to higher wages. Remember, this is all about getting wages up. I know the bell's about ready to ring, so let me finish this real quick. Safety net. Remember the safety net things like health insurance, unemployment insurance, social security. Those are the safety net ones. <coughs> also, I'm forgetting something, but it's important. Monetary policy. And that means use the Federal Reserve to raise and lower interest rates. I'm forgetting something really big. But it'll come back to me, so maybe leave it space. I promise I'll come get to it. But, I'm, but I give the basic idea this is government programs to put money, more money in the hands of workers. Oh, education. Kind of a biggie, huh? <laughs> Education spending. Because trickle economics has a, has a, no, we don't necessarily want that because that's a wage issue. Now, there's no doubt that this policy would help lead to the Great Compression because the whole goal is to put money into people's hands. But there are a couple problems. First off, government's going to get huge. And not just government, the executive. <laughs> the New Deal is going to meet a much more powerful president. And it's also going to mean if something bad happens, people are going to expect the government to do something. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but we expect that. And there's another thing. If the government gets bigger, you have a debt. Debt issue. Debt will go up, especially in bad times. But here's the biggest issue. If government is constantly trying to increase demand, you get inflation. Prices go up because people essentially bid for the relatively scarce products. Now, Keynes had a solution for all of these. And it's a little bit of solution in a lot of ways in trickle down, because trickle down was let the market deal with it. Here, well, Federal Reserve raises interest rates. And for the debt and inflation, what you do is this good times. When prices are going up, they're buying, that's when you raise taxes. You raise taxes then, and that also allows you to cut the debt. In bad times, that allows you to do things with taxes to get more money out there and also afford the debt. But the problem is, politicians don't want to raise taxes. And in good times, when tax revenues are up and everyone's spending, they that's when they want to spend more money. And so you get this weird kind of thing that will happen, especially by the 1970s, when inflation would start to go up is you're gonna have governments um, cutting money at a time, or cutting spending when they needed to spend money during bad times, yeah. So, you know, taxes during the good times to Yeah. 
Now, that's the basic element of painting economics. And so, oh, and you're not, uh, I totally forgot one thing. I know the bell rang, just listen to it. Roosevelt is going to get all these people to vote for him. It's going to be called the Roosevelt Coalition. And I think we, I told you it, but I didn't really make it clear. Because you know, think about who's voting for him now. Workers and labor unions, small farmers now, African Americans, people in the cities. Those kind of people are voting for Roosevelt. They vote for the Democratic Party to the 1970s, overwhelmingly. The Republicans got better strategy, and the Democrats did what we call a circular fire squad, firing squad. The Democrats decided, we don't want to be in power anymore. I've been recording that. Everybody better wear green tomorrow or you'll be in big trouble. I got a shirt from Ireland. You can be a Protestant and support Ireland. You better not wear that tomorrow. I have great respect for Irish nationalism. Great respect. Where are you going? In, in Dillon? Beautiful Western Montana College. Uh, we'll be doing. I'm going to talk about this stuff. I'm going to be filming mine or something. You want to go there? What do you want to do? Well, they can't. Run away. 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 Run that's a very good and thing to go yeah. You won't get the Yeah, I got like 15 points in Washington. That's great. So, Carol, if you didn't have that, you'd have to pay for about one more time. But, uh, okay, okay. And Dylan, Dylan's good. Dylan, 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 or Western is Dylan. Yeah, it's not. Dylan's not. But it's a small school. And Mr. I'm Mr. Sure. Mr. 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 Hanson? Most teachers, I find. Yeah, it's a well, it's a it's a, it's a, a normal school. You're called. Yeah, no, it's sort of obviously try it. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's probably you know, but you'll get right out of it. It's all this. Yeah, Carol's. Carol's good. The Rock. What? Where? Where are you going? I have three solutions. Yeah. You should pay. You know that word. Brings up like three. Thank you so much. Cool. <laughs> oh, we're in the uh, close, close. Thank you. And so you're going to Portland State. Possibly. MSU. You know. Yeah, it's right there. I was going to say it. Keep it up. Keep plugging away. And where are you going next year? Huh? Oh, I thought you said college. <laughs> Call me college. No, I think that is, yeah. I used to have a sweatshirt that, from uh, what we call well, it, animals. Uh, she got a blue orange shirt that just said college. And I had a sweatshirt that I had a lot of time. 
is called. And I heard you get and Bryn's going to go to the School of Hard Knocks. Okay. The School of Hard Knocks. Yeah. School of Better Class Education. I just bored you know. Yeah. I mean, the Rock and the University of Montana. Okay. So apparently, I was yeah, I did not meet for you to go laugh at, but and the thing about it is, you know, they were, you know, I mean, they're trying to, you know, like, these are people trying, that is their version of humor, trying to make fun, they're trying to make fun of liberals, and I just find it funny because, I mean, people find it funny because, well, maybe someone believes, I don't know, but I did find out yesterday that Rocky the one is a great liberal thinker. Get it? Blood sucker? Get it? Get it? <laughs> no, I think they're trying to be funny. <laughs> My guess is it's some guy in his parents' basement, I looked up 30 Donald years old, Trump finding something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he was the most qualified. So I'll give you a little time. Go ahead and finish this. So make sure you give a little bit of an explanation for each one, uh, each one of your five points and a couple different prescriptions. And then I want you to think about your evaluation and get reasons, not just because I like this because I don't like the other one. I like this because. Huh? And that's when the conservative media did have, it had the basic arguments that conservatives had there, but it does, it gets in a lot of things. It's almost like this weird kind of tribal humor. I like your outfits that and so, no, I hate cool stuff. All right, let's get to work, people. It's always exaggerated. Who knows if you actually flew, but the spirals are really close. And so you fly a close like a T-60 trainer plane. It was a P-51. Was it a P-51? Yeah. Do you have a picture of it? No, I mean, a picture of him? Yeah, I'm on the right. Right. So you made the oh, oh. Riley, you're trying to be cool. I <laughs> picture of me. Yeah, I'll see if I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can marry me. You each other. <laughs> Oh my god. Wait. I do an L Ron Hubbard float, so that's the only reason I do a float. I'm going to do the women's row. I'll tell anything. you what. Well, I've seen him before. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He's so cute. He gave me a $20 tip on my work. Now, here's the deal. I'm just going to the box. Hell in the hide is that, or make sure you that. So, what you have to do is you have to go to one of the chair persons of the vigilante presidents. <laughs> and the chair person succeeds. Mr. Carter, but he does not. So, it's Mr. Carter, Mr. Larson, Mr. College. Okay, so, and if somebody allowed you to do that, then you'd have to be made, make it very clear that Mr. Carter told you to do this. 
I allowed, and then they, they got scared and didn't do it. The day Mussolini came to, I mean, that's sorry, the day uh, Khrushchev came to Helena. I'm that was my favorite float idea ever, the day Khrushchev came to Helena. No Khrushchev ever came to Helena. Independence. Oh, but they, so their, their plan was that somebody dressed up as Khrushchev and beat a shoe on a podium. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so. Khrushchev coming to hell in 1958. You know, people would believe he did. Why did he come and I was going to, he didn't. He, did. he, did. he was just oh, being, what the hell? It was me being facetious. And, I, and they were going to do it. And then they, I think they just got lazy. But I'll run out of the good, but Khrushchev coming to hell in a... Can't do Stalin. People yeah. would complain about it. Yeah. Yeah. Is the independent a liberal thing? Uh, the independent, actually, the independent, it's actually a relatively conservative paper, but that article it's really is a, against huh? the government being involved. It really says the government did nothing to get them into the mess. <laughs> it's a little more conservative, I think. Yeah, can we do tomorrow? And make sure you give a little bit of explanation for each one. You can write it or type it or write your notes and type it. Okay, you have to explain. Okay, everybody, let's I do want to pay for so you have to pay for Yeah, do that. Um, my, I, I hate reading stuff online. I can read like short articles, but I start if I read paper, if I try to grade online, it's really hard. I know some people can do it. And I like to walk around when I grade. Five examples of five. So you're gonna, you're writing what what caused the crash and what to do. And so what you can do is you can do five conservative reasons for the crash, and then two of their prescriptions, five liberal, two of their prescriptions, and then your evaluation. And so you do bullet points and you have to give some explanation. Do you add one more thing to this? No. No, we're not a picture. Where does Trump, President Trump, go? Yes. Uh, no, don't draw a picture of Trump. It says he's against it. No, yeah, but, but what is his prescription? We all know it's prescription. The only reason I would ever get involved in one of those things is literally just to pick fights. <laughs> that's why I don't do things like Facebook or Twitter. Because that's all I would just do. Uh, I would just, I would just like people, and I would provoke. I'm very good at provoking people. Actually, I just try to like slow along, and then I try to avoid it, but then they persist. Yeah, I. Like, did you see my last post? My sister got in a fight with me. <laughs> okay, so go to take that Mr. Patrick, how is this? I can one if you say the government to me. This is a conservative view that the government can do it. Oh, yeah, I, I misunderstood what you said. And so what happens is this, this, it's actually a kind of conservative paper, mm -hmm. but it takes a liberal point of view here. Okay. okay. I was really confused. Yeah, I'm sorry. I misunderstood what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, it's actually kind of funny. So independence pretty, cons well, it's not conservapedia, but it's a little more conservative normally. But. Yeah. There's some really good stuff on there, too. And I gave you a link to the Matt Tauby thing. I don't want to know, get to work done. It's better than right there, Mom. It is pretty, we have a weak political system in this country. And part of the problem is it is being very tribal. 
Right? <laughs> in my tribe, maybe your tribe, and I don't care. Yeah, fight. <laughs> Doesn't mean that politics are bad. It's just tribal. My team is very diverse. So why do you want to fight on Will you amend Iran? <laughs> I'm terrified of it. I've bad dreams about them. They haunt me in my sleep. Really? Why do you want to amend Iran? No, I'm curious. Actually, yeah. If you want to. Yeah. That's actually a really good idea. I hate the environment. That's a good idea. I don't like circles. I don't like the diagrams. Circles. Too loud. Yeah. That's why I don't trust man. Now remember, my webpage, the Street Post, I have links and there are other links. The Matt Tiabi's articles are long. But he's the best. He's the best financial reporter I've read. A couple of his interviews. Like, Jesus, there's loads of stuff. <coughs> huh? Matt Tiabi. His article and the story on uh, Goldman Sachs. Yeah, just. What do you call it? 